Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass. Watching today's ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. I'm going to start you off with my Twitter feed here because I saw this simulation over the weekend by Matt Henderson. And what he was doing here was inside of the circle, he was going to drop these two small dots. Yep, there's two of them there. They have very slightly different initial positions. And when they're dropped and begin to bounce on the edge of the sphere, you can start to see them separate here within just a few bounces. As time goes on, the trajectories of these two spheres, as they bounce around inside of this circle, begin to take on almost what looks like chaotic behavior. Now, why I'm showing you this simulation is because this illustrates one of the struggles we have with weather forecasting. So the initial conditions that go into our weather forecast models are critical to an accurate prediction of the future state of the atmosphere. But because we don't collect perfect initial conditions, sometimes due to instrument error, sometimes due to the fact we don't even have weather uh, conditions over some places like the global oceans, the Arctic, Antarctic, in our high mountains or in deep into deserts and places like that, mean that there's always going to be uncertainty. And that can change the forecast magnitude, for example, of temperature, precipitation. It could also change the timing. And it's the timing that's been a struggle for me lately, specifically in the return of moisture to the northern plains. Now, just to make a point here, the northern plains are one of the most challenging places on Earth to forecast. The National Weather Service did a study here just for the United States looking at how predictable U.S. weather is. And based on 120 weather stations, they looked back over a pretty long time period here to see where was the least predictable and where was the most predictable uh, places to predict weather. And you can see the most predictable was Honolulu and the least predictable was Rapid City, South Dakota. And this illustrates the challenges we have in the northern plains. Now, just a quick bit about this map. For those of you that watch my content here on the West Coast, you're like, are you kidding me? You guys think you do a good job at forecasting our weather? It's extremely challenging in, in the West. Um, primarily due to the microclimates, those microclimates induced by rapid changes in elevation. So predicting, for example, in the Central Valley of California or up the I-5 corridor, the Columbia Basin, the Snake River Valley, even the Great Basin, those are very challenging areas to forecast as well. Why we tend to look at this and see more predictability is primarily due to the fact that we have a Mediterranean climate on the West Coast. So there's a very distinct wet and dry season, and therefore the overall statistic looks better. But let's come back to what I struggled with a week ago. This was the timing, uh, the timing of this event, I should say, is what gave me so much trouble. It's this trough right here. Now, on Monday last week, I had thought that this would already be over the mountains, pulling in a lot of Gulf moisture heading to the northern plains. And we watched and we said, we got to keep an eye on this. This is the most critical piece moving forward. Now, by Monday afternoon and evening, we had already started to see that the forward advancement of that wave, I just put the arrow in there, had slowed considerably. And it had changed, and it was going to get stuck in the Gulf of Alaska. Now, if you'd like to get more updates from me, it's uh, you can do that. Just email me, eric, E-R-I-C, dot snodgrass, S-N-O-D-G-R-A-S-S, -S, at nutrien.com, and I'll get you signed up for my, my daily reports that go out. What you've got here, though, is that this particular wave is still hanging out here. And I had thought it would already have been in this position. Now, what we do have right now is to its south and east, a deep cutoff low that's coming over the Great Basin right here through the, the, the um, uh, well, basically it just came through Utah, but it's out of Nevada coming into um, parts of Arizona and New Mexico. And this has opened up the Gulf of Mexico for a lot of moisture transport. It's going to kick off a series of severe storms yet again in the next couple of days. But it's this wave right here that I'm going to be watching most carefully moving forward. And let me show you what it looks like right now. So we're going to use the European model, and we're going to play this out through the day on Monday. Now, what we're going to notice here is that as we go through Monday into Tuesday midday in the Tuesday evening, that wave is still taking its dear sweet time to get here across the northern uh, northwestern part of the United States and over the mountains. And to its south, this, this wave right here, this short wave, is what's going to initialize a multi-day severe weather event. I should say the continuation of a multi-day severe weather event down here in the southern plains. The flow is split, though. Big branch going to the north, the southern branch here. Now, what's interesting about this is as I get into the middle of this week, Wednesday, now getting into Thursday, that wave, I'm, I'll rock you back and forth here. You can see how it continues to deepen. While out ahead of it, southerly flow brings moisture farther to the north. And this wave will eventually grab this other low. You saw it a moment ago, just north and east of Hawaii. Well, it's still sitting here. 
And the two are going to come together, deepen into what we call the negative P&A pattern across the West. And this, by the, end, by the time we get through this week, will uh, extract enough moisture out of the Gulf to bring it far enough to the North that I think we're going to be seeing our best chances in a very long time of returning moisture here toward the Northern Plains and the Canadian Prairie. Now, the other part about this pattern, the West will go cool under that trough. And that's why the trough exists, because there's cold air near the surface. And when you get east of the Rocky Mountains, we're going to see a major warm-up, especially here getting into the Great Lakes Basin. Any place that's cooler than normal east of the Rockies is because of cloud cover and precipitation as we work our way through this next week. So let's get in here and see the new result. This is the brand new data just this morning from the European model. We're looking at precipitation anomalies. And you can see how the Gulf of Mexico is open up wide. And moisture is trying to return here to the northern plains of the United States, even back into Montana. Now, seeing this and seeing these new updates, we're going to analyze the likelihood of this happening. We're going to take a look at the latest model updates, and we're really going to discuss why this whole pattern is keeping things so dry here. And there's a, going to be a very sharp boundary, likely, in this area, where to the east of it, we won't see anything in terms of precip for a lot of this week. And the west of it, the, the gulf is going to be open wide open. Now, what's been interesting, too, is that, you know, I like to compare the European model to the GFS, and I do have in the plans here in a couple of weeks to kind of really make sure that you all know the differences in those models. Well, the European model made an adjustment toward the GFS going drier in this area where it had been wetter. Just something important to take note of here. But this is what we had yesterday. This large high parked off the coast was just feeding moisture into the south. And we're going to continue to watch these waves work in tandem to pull that moisture farther and farther to the north. A high pressure cell to the east, a low pressure trough to the west, and the two factors are going to just draw an abundant amount of moisture through the plains of the United States. Now when they did this yesterday, look at this satellite animation. I'll just go through till about sundown right there. You can see the open wave that's coming through parts of, um, well, out of Nevada into eventually Arizona and New Mexico. It's Just watch, you'll see the spin right over here if I go back and forth. That is going to be the slow mover out ahead of that deeper trough cutting into the northwest. But the, the atmosphere just exploding here in the midsection of the country, uh, producing a lot of severe convection, a lot of really nasty weather uh, in that area. From there, I would like to show you how much precip we had over the last 72 hours through early this morning. And you start to see a few of these areas getting way up here in my color bar. Now, some of that is due to some hail contamination in this area, uh, but it's also just due to the fact that some of these storms produced extremely heavy rainfall. But you can see the effect of opening the Gulf. You can see where the cutoff low on the back side here came through California and Nevada, putting the precip on this side of the Sierra Nevada mountains and the Klamath mountains here. And this is all going to just slowly meander to the east, leaving this area dry for much of this week. Now that's important because if we look back over the last, uh, this is 47 days here, we can see the impacts of what this pattern has been up to this point. And you'll notice that it had been dry in parts of Oklahoma and Kansas. It had been dry, of course, in the Northern Plains. And a pocket right here in Iowa, Minnesota, and Wisconsin extending over to the lower Michigan region had been dry too, despite some bigger rains that came through this area during Mother's Day weekend. We also have a dry corridor that's here in parts of the Mid-Atlantic. And of course, the West has just continued its record dryness here throughout this spring. From there, let's walk over and take a quick look at the very top four inches of soil moisture. Now you can see where the rains recently have really brought the moisture up in the plains, but uh, we need to keep this moisture moving farther to the north, into the upper Midwest, into the northern plains, into the Canadian prairie, and that will help with the drought situation in this area. There are pockets in the eastern Corn Belt through the mid-Atlantic that are very dry as well, and we need to keep a close eye on what this forecast is going to deliver to them. And of course, you can see the topsoil issues we have here with drought conditions uh, in the west. So I want to just show you quickly what we um, got over the weekend in terms of hail. So this was through midnight uh, today, so early, early this morning, and a lot of places here in the high plains of Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, and Colorado, New Mexico that saw a lot of hail. 
Uh, this is just the streaks here from the maximum estimated hail size. And early this morning, we were still watching those storms race through parts of Texas, uh, and then also a series of storms that had moved uh, right there on the um, Louisiana-Texas border. Had been some thunderstorm clusters, too, that moved out of Illinois and Indiana. I was just watching them this morning on one of my favorite sites, blitzertongue.org. If you like to watch lightning, got to check out this website, blitzertongue.org. Okay. This is, I think, where the pattern is truly going to be defined as we go forward. I'm going to step you up one mile in the atmosphere, and we're going to look at winds. And I'm just going to move this forward pretty quickly because you're going to see the effect of that slow-moving trough that's coming into the west. You see, because this is slow, this high-pressure cell in the low levels of the atmosphere just sits and spins over uh, the Mid-Atlantic in the northeast. And the net effect is to really crank the temperatures up here keep it very dry and then on the back side just wide open moisture transport to the gulf of mexico from the gulf of mexico i should say hopefully by the time we get to the middle end of this week all the way into the northern plains of the united states that is the setup now how far does that moisture go well, this may look like a temperature map, but it's a dew point temperature map. So when you look at the colors here, don't think about air temperature. Think about moisture. Uh, the higher the values, the more moisture there is in the atmosphere. So here's the desert. Here's the dry, cool air that's in Canada. And as we move this forward, you're just going to watch the Gulf stay wide open. I mean, look at how far to the north we're transporting that Gulf moisture. And as it just keeps going there, the hope is, is that, let me just step you back, that we bring it far enough to the north throughout this week that we return moisture to this area into the northern plains of the United States. But as I just play it forward, you, you notice that getting all the way out here to the 26th, the ECMWF is just not backing down from that pattern, bringing that moisture into place. Now today, we're going to watch Texas as having a moderate risk of severe storms. Those storms are moving through early this morning. We expect them to clear out, and I expect very warm temperatures to pop up as the sun comes out. That will rapidly destabilize the atmosphere in this area. But we're going to have so much moisture because the dry land will be so far to the west that this is an area that I expect to have very cold upper level temperatures because of the trough sweeping through, but an abundant amount of moisture. And as a result, I'm worried about big hail in this area, as is the Storm Prediction Center. But you can see as we go from day one in the convective forecast to day two, this just barely moves its way to the east. And so we're going to continue to watch this area moving forward this week. Now, the high-resolution rapid refresh model was very well initialized this morning. You see the cluster of thunderstorms here the second one down here along the border, and then the rain that did move through parts of the Midwest here in the overnight hours. So what we're going to see here is that that cluster of storms throughout the day turns into what looks to be some sort of quasi-linear convective system that presses over toward, for example, Dallas, stretching back here into central Texas. So we're going to watch that through the morning hours. And it should fizzle and then reinvigorate later in the afternoon as it gets over here to the Louisiana-Texas borders. You're going to have a second round of storms in this area. Meanwhile, to the north, you can start to see in the afternoon, we're going to be seeing some pockets of heavy rain and some thunderstorm activity here. There's a boundary sitting right in this area. And then as we play this forward, it'll be tonight, large supercells are forecast to bump up uh, right here along the dry line. And then... We're going to notice that the models, once again, try to blow this out into some sort of convective system that moves along the Red River Valley of the south here. And we're going to continue in the overnight hours to just convect and pop storms in this region. Meanwhile, while that's occurring, there is a, a, that, that, a, a wave in the low levels of the atmosphere that's going to kind of eject here through Missouri into Illinois, increasing the rainfall in this area. But as I said, while we'll see some scattered storms in this area, there'll be a pocket here that's going to stay relatively dry. And I'd like to show you that by flipping over to the European model. So we just looked at the HER, the High Resolution Rapid Refresh. Let's now get through where it finished its forecast right there. Okay, moving forward, this is an open gulf convective pattern. So the European will struggle with telling you how much precipitation you're going to get because it's going to be thunderstorm based. What I want you to see is the main features, and here they are. As we play this forward, first thing to take note of here, here's the trough coming into the Pacific Northwest. That's the one that is going to finally, I hope, draw the moisture into this area. We'll see in a few moments. Two, watch the high pressure set up here, and this area 
staying wide open to the transport ready. So this is 7 a.m. tomorrow on Monday, central, or excuse me, Tuesday, central time, playing through the day, getting into Wednesday afternoon and evening. Now we get out here to Thursday and, and we can see it. Do you, do you notice the high pressure is elongated along the East Coast? This stays open. The wave comes through and that's what does it. That's what could increase the precip in Montana. That's what could eject out here into the northern plains bringing in precip. There's a cold front right in through there and there's enough lift. There's enough moisture. We, we will see precipitation in this area. As we go forward, this is now Thursday afternoon evening, getting into Friday morning, afternoon and evening. This is our best chance at the end of the week just to see the storms there. Meanwhile, that high pressure cell stays in place here. And as we go forward into next week, this is well into the weekend, excuse me, this is Saturday afternoon and evening. Now getting out here to Sunday, that front really struggles to make it much farther than there. So we'll see some cooler air coming into Montana and into the West behind this. But it just doesn't knock out the really warm air that's in place. And I'll just let this go all the way out to next Monday afternoon. And that's what we've got. And you see it again. The model is trying to just keep better chances of moisture return and precip to the northern plains. But as I said last week, let's watch this evolve this week to see how much we eventually get. Now, the latest European model run shows us this. So this was last night getting into this morning. As we play this forward, we'll see that throughout the day today and into tomorrow, this is where we're expecting the majority of our thunderstorm activity. There's the wave coming into the northwest. Keep playing this forward. You see that by Thursday, there it is, getting into the day on Friday, that is when we have our best chances at the end of this week for moisture return to Montana, North and South Dakota in terms of storms and the Southern Canadian Prairie. Okay, As we just let this go on out, though, I'll let it play out to one week. This is now getting out to next Sunday night. Very limited scattered showers at best here, but drier under that larger area of high pressure. What's the GFS say? It's got a little bit different flavor to this, but we would expect that. Convection is hard to predict. That's the GFS through the next seven days. Again, this is the European. And I'll kind of go back and forth, and you can take a look at your region and see some of the differences here. Maybe it'll be easier to see it if I show you the anomalies. So that's the week one precipitation anomaly figure from the European. All right. And then this is the GFS. So European and the GFS. Feel free to pause it and take a look at those differences. What about week two? Well, by day 10, the European has a trough in the Aleutian Islands, the negative PNA pattern. So that's where the ridge comes up here and then drops into the west. Broader trough, excuse me, excuse me, broader ridging across the midsection of the United States, and a deeper trough anchored between the Hudson Bay and Greenland. Now, because of that pattern, this is what it's predicting in terms of precip. You can see it continues into week two to keep this area very active and stormy. It keeps the southeast dry, keeps part of the mid-Atlantic dry, but it wants to keep returning that moisture farther to the north. Does the GFS see the same thing? Well, here's the pattern. There is a trough there, negative PNA in the deeper trough between the Hudson and Greenland, and overall a very similar flow. And that's why they look quite similar. You can see that it's this area that the models want to open the moisture transport to. It's the southeast that remains relatively dry over to the lower Mississippi River Valley. And overall, the models are in decent agreement here with the zero Z runs on predicting out what we expect into that week two time period. From there, let's flip over our discussion to temperatures. This is a map showing you from April 1st through May 14th what our um, what our uh, growing degree day anomalies have looked like. Now, we know that April and early May were quite cool east of the Rocky Mountains, and we can see the deficits in GDUs. This is not quite as severe as we saw a year ago, especially in the eastern part of the Corn Belt, but for, certainly for Texas, we've missed out on a lot of, of heat. Meanwhile, well above normal in the West Coast, California, up to Oregon and Washington, uh, due to some recent very warm temperatures there, we've accumulated a lot of these heat units. So where are we going? Well, it's important to know that over the last seven days, this cold air that's been anchored in place is gone. It's out. The only place in the country that I'm really talking about a risk of frost is going to be in parts of Montana, and that's going to be largely, you know, into the into the western side of the state. 
So as we look at those high temperatures over the next seven days, where you see the cooler colors in through here, this is cloud cover and precipitation dominated, okay? As we go from Monday's highs into Tuesday, and then into Wednesday, again, it's all going to be due to cloud cover and precip until that more negative PNA pattern comes in. So you can see it. Look, the northeast heats up, the northwest starts to cool down, and some reprieve comes in from the heat we've seen in California. So this is now getting into Thursday's high temperatures compared to normal and into Friday. So this is where I'm concerned about the frosty conditions here. But again, we're backing this up pretty far uh, to, to the west here. But overall, we could be seeing temperatures 10 to 15 degrees cooler than normal in the west while the east really heats up under that ridge. Then we go into the weekend, that's Saturday and Sunday. That's the temperature pattern we expect this week. Let's just stretch this out day 5 through 10. You notice that during that time period, the European model is predicting broad scale warmth in this section of the country. In the cooler weather down here, again, a lot of this is dominated by cloud cover, but the trough coming into the northwest is what's keeping Montana through the Canadian prairie a bit on the cooler side of things. Let's go from there over to the GFS ensemble to see the same thing. The patterns are quite similar in our two models right now. And to stretch this out longer term, this is now the day 10 through 15 from the GFS. Generally, the pattern's more relaxed with a more northward jet stream. That's why you see broad scale warmth. The European, I know it's a little, little different view. I've yet to reproduce this map here uh, with my mapping suite. But again, we, we don't see strong signals either way, except for in the southeast uh, through the mid-Atlantic, where we do expect some warmer conditions. And that's consistent in both models. I want to finish up with a, one last thing here. I want to do a little bit long-range discussion, and then we'll be done, okay? So uh, ECMWF's projection of the MJO. What's important about this is that the MJO is on this side of the diagram. And just in simplest terms, for much of North America, this would be the, the warmer side of things. Cooler side would be here. Now, as we move into summer, we won't so much focus on the MJO as a temperature forecasting mechanism, but more on a precipitation forecasting mechanism. And I'll explain more about that in future updates. But what I want to get to is some of the new long range data from the IRI multi-model group. They tend to be the latest in getting out their stuff because they do a statistical analysis on all the dynamical forecasts. Now, what this means is they try to remove bias and you've got this forecast produced now in May for the June, July and August uh, time period. We're looking at precipitation probabilities. So these colors would be drier than normal and these would be wetter. Now you notice that many of the other models try to make the split almost on the Mississippi River where there's greater risk to the west of being drier. The IRI multi-model group is trying to keep that more in the plains and the high plains and then definitely here from California through the Pacific Northwest. That is their latest update. More storm activity plus an active hurricane season is still in the forecast here for the um, eastern part of the United States. Let's flip over and take a look at temperatures. This is the um, June, July, August temperature forecast. Generally speaking, the model is favoring much above average temperatures from the four corner states ejecting into the plains. Uh, they, the, they've picked up on a cooler bias in the northern plains. I'm not 100% sure as to why this is. Um, this would, to be honest, suggest that the ridge is in place here and we could get some flow that does that which would keep this whole sector here, maybe I should broaden that a bit, but stormy throughout this summer, if that would be the case. Uh, but we're just gonna have to watch this all evolve. Um, about the only predictor we've got for this far out is gonna be ocean temperatures. And that's where I'm gonna finish today. This is our latest map of uh, global ocean temperature anomalies. And what I would like to share with you about this map is how much it has changed in the last month. And that's what you're gonna see right here. Now, this map compares one month ago to today. We would expect north of the equator to see more red because it's moving through spring towards summer and blue south of the equator. What I am most interested in is the fact that this is so very warm here and here. That's a large increase over two degrees Celsius. But you see this area here, some places in through here cooled off. Now, you know that I have stressed that that would be an uh, important component to what we call the Pacific Meridional Mode, specifically its negative phase. And why I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this so carefully is that this whole region continues to stay cooler than normal. 
And I just want to add something to the forecast you got from the IRI multi-model group. And we'll finish here. I know that their, their statistical analysis keeps this region dry and the Pacific Northwest. But what I would like to just state is that that cold ocean pattern tends to keep this whole area inside here uh, ha having a greater risk of regional drought development throughout summer. And I want to watch it carefully. That's all that I want to say here. All right. I appreciate your attention. Have a great rest of your week. And we'll talk to you soon. Thanks.